150 years ago, my ancestors came down to Nisqually to sign the Treaty of Medicine Creek. This was Washington Territory then, and the whites convinced the Indians to trade their lands in exchange for the right to fish in all the usual and accustomed places. This wasn't the way it worked out. Any time now, the cottonwoods here will be have cotton floating in the air. And that's when Dad always said when the cotton is floating in the air, that's when the spring salmon are in the river. And that was a calendar. You know, we didn't have calendars. We didn't have any time clocks or anything. When the, when the tide went out, the table was set for all of us. Now today has changed, you know. But still the tide goes out and the tide comes in, you know, twice in 24 hours. And that's very important to the, the world as it moves and the world as it goes around and the moon and the stars and everything that makes us, makes us whole. The Indian men in the Northwest are fishermen. And every time they went fishing, they would get arrested. And they would be put in jail. And the whole meaning of their culture and their life would be just stripped from them. And so they would come out, go back on the water, get arrested again, and start it all over. And they were told that their lives were meaningless, that they were doing something that was illegal and wrong, and that they were lazy, and. Uh, Tacoma had open season on Indians, I mean shooting Indians, well into the 20th century, into the mid-20th century. So, you know, they grew up in a really difficult time. Well, I think it was racism. You know, it was sure, truly racism uh, when it comes to Indian people and their treaty rights and their way of life. They took our children away, that sovereignty. They took our language away that sovereignty, they took our culture away. They, they tried to make it all disappear. Where they uh, became brutal was in that first January 62 arrest action. And they had helicopters, they had police dogs. Uh, and that was the first time that the state had introduced dogs. Uh, against uh, the fishermen in, in making arrests. It's illegal gear and it's going to be taken. We're all members. We are too. We're poaching. What are you doing? We're not, we're not either. You're the one that's poaching. All under arrest are facing a cold bar. The state was saying that they weren't allowed to take those fish because those fish were for non Indian sportsmen. They weren't for Indians. For us, the salmon have always been sacred. This is hard for non-Indians to understand. In the early days, there were so many salmon. Some said you could walk across the water on their spines. Without the salmon, maybe we wouldn't be Indians. The salmon is in our spirit and always in our heart. They just didn't give up. They just kept going back and back and back and back and back. They were doing something that was in their view, fully legal. It was traditional. Uh, it was right. And the game wardens were trying to grab their boat, grab them in the boat, grab their net, and um, Indians would be trying to push them off, get them away from their boat. Sometimes they would be dumped in the river, uh, heads held under. I would sometimes gather the children and try to, you know, take them away. But children that uh, see those scenes, and I can remember Suzette uh, Mills, Maisel's oldest daughter, uh, her oldest couple of kids, at times would just be silent, and they'd just be so tight, so angry, and you just feel, you know, do these game wardens or, or sheriffs have an idea the impact that they're going to have on the next generation? Do they have an idea what they're doing?
Well, there was uh, there was six of us all together at the beginning, and then there was more than that. You know, we had a the community had a lot of uh, different tribes and different people came in and and helped us. Now, even non-Indians and uh, the blacks and the Mexican and uh, Filipino people and everybody, everybody came and gathered. You know, and, and this is in the '60s now when the Poor People's Campaign was going on and uh, the, the place was burning down in New York and Los Angeles and the civil rights movement was going full blast and and uh, marching in, in uh, Zelma, Alabama. And we were taking part in all of these things, you know, because we were fighting for our treaty rights and fighting for our way of life. So we gathered into that mix of people. A beauty The city of Tacoma come down and the game department and and the Washington Department of Fish and they gassed us on the Puyallup River that day on a bus and and raided our camp over there, our fishing camp. And that's when the United States decided to take the case. And and that became the US versus Washington. Judge Bolt listened to all of our people. He listened to all of our older people talking, and uh, he understood them. He, he knew that we had our language, we knew that we had our culture and our way of life and what we thought of everything here. You know, that we lived here for these thousands of years, and, and he interpreted treaty, and, and that was the best thing that ever could have happened to us, that interpretation. And we, and in 1974, that ruling came down. And in 1979, the United States Supreme Court upheld it. And so, and it's been sitting there ever since, and we're still implementing that decision. Yeah, so yeah, he was a little bit of a hellion, but he was a Marine and served with distinction in Korea. Uh, he was a fisherman before and he was a fisherman after and he came back to fight the fishing rights struggle and to bear the beatings and the arrests and the incarcerations, uh, the disparagement of outside society and the efforts to wipe Frank's Landing off the map. The heartbreak of not being able to make a, an honest living in the eyes of Washington citizens was something hard for Billy and for his brother-in-law, Al Bridges. No one has done more for Indian treaty rights, uh, fishing, uh, natural resources management and, and the sovereignty of the tribes uh, than Billy in the past quarter century. And that's an impact that's felt throughout the Northwest, but it's also felt throughout the nation in the efforts of many tribes in a whole range of pursuits, cultural, legal, political, economic. The whole thing was to protect our, our way of life and protect our, our tribes and protect our ceremonies and all of these things. And, and, and if you think about that, you can never get away from that because, um, you know, you always come home and even though we were in Washington, D.C. and we are in Zelma, Alabama and we were all over the country and wounded knee and different other things that we were doing, Alcatraz and things. We always came back to home. This is where we belong. We had to be very strong just to get something we always had. It was there from the beginning and it was even written down in the Treaty of Medicine Creek. We had lost a lot of our land. But I'll bet Chief Leshai is smiling to see the salmon coming back and our people still at home.